Are we all awake? Yes, sir. We're all caffeinated. We're feeling good. Beautiful. Welcome to uh, first service. We have another service at 1130, a traditional service. We'd love to see it, all of them. Um, we, uh, we are learning to be the authentic expression of the kingdom of heaven. And so with that, it means we learn to share our stories. And so in this series, it's been a lot of fun. We've talked about zombie tacos. We've talked about accidents. We've talked about some really interesting, vulnerable moments within, within a relationship. We've talked about alligator, near alligator death experiences. We've talked about a lot of these awesome stories because we all have a story. And so we've had these different themes. And so today we have another theme. And the theme today is Family Matters. And I'm not talking about that early 90s show with, uh, with Urkel. The idea is that family does matter. And so we've got two presenters that are going to share some concepts and some stories about family, what family's meant to them. Our first presenter is Shauna Naranjo. And Shauna has a story about what, what it means to be in a family and what it looks like when we, we, we come together in that circle. When we come together and it creates that protective barrier where there's love and compassion and mercy shown. And so please welcome Shauna to the stage. Thank you, Pastor Tony. So I wanted to share my story today. Um, a circle defines family for me. See, when my mom and dad were young, 14 and 15 years old, they gave birth to my brother. And shortly after, I came along my mom being 16 years old at the time. They were married and quickly got divorced. So by the time I was three, they had separated and went their own ways. My brother went to go live with my dad, and I stayed with my mom. So at that moment, it made for a very lonely childhood for me because my brother was gone, and my dad became an absent father. See it was never guaranteed for my dad to pick me up every other weekend, as I was told. So I remember moments when I'd wait for him and I'd run to that window thinking, that car, that's my dad, he's coming to get me. Only to find out that he wouldn't show up that weekend. No phone call, nothing. So it was difficult. And my mom had a hard time too. She was a single mother and she had to be mother and father to me. So she decided she needed to do something better to better our life. So she started college full time in the day when I was in school and evenings she would work. And she'd work till 3 a.m. And the thing about that was most of the time I came home to an empty house. So I'd come home, I'd make my own meals, go to a friend's house sometimes, if I was invited over there, and I'd tuck myself in at night. And it was lonely, and I was scared, because your mind at that age, at age six, being there alone, plays tricks on you. And I found myself thinking that there was someone in the closet that's going to come out. So I'd go and search every closet in the house until it was clear and then I tuck myself in. When I tuck myself in, the noises began. The house was creaking, and there was even a time when someone actually tried to get through my bedroom window. It was so scary, I ran to my neighbor, and she called my mom at work, and she came home, and it was okay at that moment, but. I just was so lonely at that time, and I looked forward to those every other weekends. And so when I did go, I thought, great, this is wonderful. My dad had remarried. He married a woman that had two daughters, and they were young. And shortly, they had their own two kids, and uh, my brother Felix and my sister Heather. Heather was the baby. and. I'd go over there and I thought, this is fantastic. Now I have someone to, to play with and not be lonely. And it was great for that. But 
I started realizing that things weren't that great there. See, this stepmother was verbally and physically abusive to us. And my dad was the one that dished out the punishments. And I remember many times, anytime we got in trouble, we'd be put in a corner. And I'm not talking about for a few minutes. I'm talking for hours, two, three hours at a time. And God forbid our knees buckle because my dad was quick with the belt. I remember my stepmother punishing my sister Barbie and I because we told a lie. We were kids. We were only about seven or eight years old. We were always trying to get away with something. And she made us sit on the couch for 30 minutes at a time with hot sauce in her mouth for 30 minutes. And at that moment, my siblings and I thought, we need to do something. We need some kind of protection. And the way we did that was we'd wait for them to go to sleep. And we'd go into one of the bedrooms. And my older brother, Tony, gathered us and said, let's get closer. Let's, let's get a circle going. Let's hold hands. And Shauna, Barbie, grab the younger ones. Hold on to them. And at the time, I didn't realize why he was saying that. And I'm not sure what he thought was going to happen. But I listened. And we started this circle. And he started this prayer. And what it said was, Satan, we rebuke you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he repeated it over and over again. And we started joining until he stopped. And he said, you guys, do you feel that? And there were no words. We just shook our head yes. Because at that moment, one of us noticed this brightness coming off the hallway and the presence of God. We knew at that time that God had answered our prayers. We felt peace. We felt safe. See, that circle became an image for my brothers and sisters that meant unity. And at that time, I didn't realize until about 30 years later what an impact that had. And then last year came, and my sister and I were having a conversation, and none of us had been under the same roof in over 30 years. And we thought it was time for a family reunion. So we made our way to my sister's house. And we found ourselves doing something oddly natural. We started forming this circle, the same circle that we formed when we were young. It was like time had never passed. We were right back at that moment. And we told of everything that we had gone through and what we overcame and where we were at. And these stories were about, for instance, my brother Felix. He was the, the youngest son. And he was very mischievous. And he decided it would be OK to get into the cookies that we were not supposed to get into. And my stepmother and my dad lined us up. We always had that line and said, who ate these cookies? But you see, we had a pact. We had a pact not to snitch. And if that meant we all went down, that's what happened. We all went down. So one by one, my brother Tony said, I took the cookies. I ate them. And then my sister Barbie, no, nope, it was me, punish me. And the, here I go, no, nope, I ate them. Don't listen to them, I ate them. And by the time it got to my sister Chrissy, they were so frustrated 
that they walked away. And we were in shock because that never happened. We did, never escaped our punishments. And it led me to the time when my dad was punishing us. And he always used that belt. But this day, that belt broke as he snapped it. And we thought, yes, it's not going to happen. But my dad was in construction, so he had two by fours laying around. And he came with that, and that was our punishment. And at that moment, we realized, wow, look at what God has done for us. Look where we're at. This circle is keeping us together and comforting us. And at that moment, the circle that protected us, the, the circle comforted us, the circle made us family. And now when we get together, it's that same circle that forms, the same circle that brings us support when we're scared, healing when we're in pain, rescue when we're in need of hope. The circle is a constant reminder for me of family because in family, it's when we're the strongest. Thank you. Amen. Uh, afterwards, our speakers are going to be in the back, so please shake their hands, give them love. It takes a lot of courage. That was beautiful. That image of the circles. Family is where we come together, where there's unity, there's protection, there's restoration. Family matters. And so our next presenter is going to share about how family sometimes is not on our radar. Sometimes we're not expecting family or we're not hoping for family. But it's that family that actually can create the fullest opportunity to experience life. And so if you would, please give a hand for Joe Schmitz. Good morning. I'll apologize for reading here. So I wasn't sure that I wanted kids. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was three, and then my mom uh, married a man who built a boat and lived on it. <clears throat> he was a disciplinarian, a, a man's man. So he'd uh, cuff me on the back of my head and leave a welt for things like speaking out of turn or chewing with my mouth open. When he'd spank me, he'd use a, a paint stirrer, but they would break, so then he went to a thicker stick. Um, you know, when you, when, you, when you hit a kid with a stick that won't break, it's not a spanking, it's a beating. So that's what would happen when he was sober. Uh, one night when he was drunk, uh, he made me climb the mast in my underwear. It was wet and cold, and the rigging was slippery, and sorry. My mom was down below pleading with him to put away the knife. I was 10. I didn't want kids because I was afraid I might be like him. And I didn't want to treat my kids that way. Charlotte, help me understand that just because I lived with someone didn't mean that I'd be like them. So I grew up as a loner, smallest, poorest kid. So I became a bookworm. I read everything, especially biographies. And, and uh, because they write stories about people that do things, great things, you know, I always felt like I could do that and be that. You know, I, I still believe that too, both for myself and for other people. <clears throat> so Charlotte and I met. September 22nd, 1983. In August, we'll be married 30 years. Thanks. That was kind of unexpected. <laughs> Early on, we decided that it was important to start our, our relationship with a spiritual base. On the inside of our wedding rings, we had inscribed all things 
for Romans 8.28. You can't see it anymore, but we said that it didn't rub off at war in. In spite of that, all marriages have difficulties, and we struggle with the things that most couples do. Money, sex, selfishness. By that I mean like when you feel like you're giving more to the relationship than your partner, and they're not giving the same amount back. It may not be true, but that's how we feel. You forget all the reasons why you fell in love in the first place. It's difficult when it seems like your partner no, no longer is interested in meeting your needs. That becomes ma magnified with stressors like money problems or work problems. By the way, if you're listening to this, if you had a marriage that didn't last, you shouldn't feel like a failure. Your circumstances are your own. Life is complicated and messy and leads us in unexpected directions. It's important to embrace who you are and how valuable you are to yourself and to God. After years of struggle, we sought counseling. That's difficult. It means admitting that you can't figure out your problems yourself. If you're a man, it means you can't fix it. If you're a woman, it means that you're not the perfect wife and mother. You feel like a failure. For us, it was the only way to get past the issues that we couldn't seem to solve year after year after year. Counseling gave us a way to express our feelings with a neutral party to help us getting over the rough spots. So the thing is, I love Charlotte. I didn't want to be apart, nor did I want us to rot together. Thoreau calls it living lives of quiet desperation. I wanted us to thrive and grow and be together. It took humbling ourselves to seek solutions. It's not a fix or a switch or a Band-Aid. It's a lifelong process. So Pastor Tony actually asked me to talk about family. We have two daughters. Kaylee is in college, and Morgan is going into the eighth grade. They say God only gives you what you can handle. Well, apparently he thinks I'm a wimp because we have these really amazing kids. Uh, people compliment us on how well-behaved they are. I don't think I can take credit for that. We do our best as parents, just like you do. Our kids are the people they are because that is who they are. I don't get to take credit for their successes or their failures. They own those, and I couldn't be more proud of them. However, we're known as the strict parents. When our kids ask to go somewhere with their friends, we want to know who they're going with, where they're going, how long they're going to be there, and what adults are going to be there. Kaylee told me that her friends quit asking her to go places because they knew that her parents would ask these questions. You know, that can be tough on them. So our kids know that we have high expectations for them. The joke is, I'm the tiger dad. My daughters tell me they could come home with 98 on a test, and I'd ask about the two they missed. So there's truth to that criticism. Not entirely because I do praise the result, but I am too hard on them sometimes, and Charlotte helps me with that. I do believe we learn best from our mistakes, but only if we really look at them. And we want on our children to learn just how valuable failure is because it teaches us the lessons that we need to learn. So when Charlotte and I decided to have children, we made some decisions. First, we decided they didn't come first. As a couple, we came first. That was the first relationship. And then it was a relationship with our kids. Because if we couldn't feed our own relationship, we couldn't do that for our children either. I'd say that was the best parenting decision we ever made. Second, it was important for our girls to know that we love them, that their father loves them. I tell my girls I love them every day. I'd say prayers every night, sing five verses of Amazing Grace, Two verses of I come to the garden in my really bad singing voice. Third, we want them to know we accept them, period. They're going to do things we disagree with. They're going to make mistakes. Char and I talked about what happens if they come home and said, Mom, Dad, I'm whatever is. We want them to know that they can always come home, and it's always safe to come home, and their love is not conditional on the decisions they make or the actions that they take. 
In our house, we say, I love you this much, even more, no matter what. Fourth, we wanted to teach our kids to be self-reliant. Think for yourself. Peers will try to influence you, as well as advertisers, politicians, preachers, and teachers. Just because they have titles, positions, or popularities doesn't mean that they're right. I think that's one of the most important lessons we've tried to teach our kids, that and a love for learning. Finally, we tried to teach them about money, that money is a tool that can be a double-edged sword. From the time they were really, really little, we told them that the three laws of money in order were give it, save it, then spend it. I wasn't sure that I wanted a family. Now I can't imagine a life without them. Thank you. Oh, so good. So beautiful. The idea of family, of community, is all throughout Scripture. And if you've ever read the Bible, you'll see it over and over and over again. For the Hebrews, when, when, when you messed up, when you made a poor decision, it wasn't your decision. It didn't impact you. It impacted all of community. And so community would bring you back in and bring healing and restoration once again. That's what community did. That's what community should do. And so you see all throughout Scripture this teased out through the festivals, through the different ways in which people interacted, even the way they lived in the homes that they had. The structure of the home even gave that. Let me share with you something interesting. One of my favorite verses in the New Testament is John 14. And John 14 is often used like this. Someday, kids, you're going to get a mansion. If you're good enough, you'll get a mansion. The streets will be gold. You'll get a crown. But the mansion, just wait. And that's what we've done with this verse. But let me give you a little more context because this verse is actually really deeply meaningful and we miss it sometimes. Jesus' ministry was this. He said, the kingdom of heaven I bring to you. The kingdom of heaven, he said, is here within you, around you, here until eternity, through eternity. Kingdom of heaven, it's what I bring. It's a new reality, a new way of being in the world. And so he shares this all throughout his life, even at his death and resurrection. But he tells his disciples in this moment, I have stirred the pot. The religious, the political, the economic system is not happy. They will crucify me. And the disciples say, what? What's going on? How do we, how do we keep moving in this, this new reality without you? And here is Jesus' response. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You are trusting in God. Now trust in me. See, John prepared the way for Jesus. Jesus prepared the way for you and me so that we can walk in this new reality. And then Jesus uses a beautiful metaphor. This is a beautiful marriage metaphor. When you as a young Jew saw that girl that you were in love with, you wanted to marry her or you wanted to marry him. What would happen is you'd, you'd catch eyes and then there'd be a connection and eventually you'd go before the fathers, the two fathers, and you'd ask for their blessing and you'd go through this ritual and before you knew it, something's signed, gifts are given there within that one house and you were considered married before a large ceremony happened. Now you couldn't just take off with your partner in marriage yet. Because community needed to come together to give the blessing. So what happened is this. You would stay with your family. He would then go to his father's house. And at his father's house, he lives with grandma and grandpa, mom and dad, brothers and sisters, their partners, their kids. Do you guys get how big this house is? Some of you are worried that your in-law might live with you someday. Think about the whole family. That is drama. But that's what happened. And so the husband, he would go home and he would create a room that was a part of the larger home. Do you get it? 
In the home, it would look like something like this. There'd be many rooms in this home. And the husband would go and he would prepare the room just for his bride. And after the ceremony, he would then take his bride home to his father's house. So Jesus says, this message I've given you is to be lived and celebrated right here, right now, and into eternity. This message I give you is to be experienced and lived, and it's supposed to be in community. That's where you experience the divine. It's in community where we argue and we fight and we share vulnerable stories. It's in community that we experience God the most. There's this word, it's called Trinity. How many of you ever heard of the Trinity? Have you ever looked in the Bible for that word? You won't find it. You won't actually find the word Trinity anywhere. Because the word Trinity is not something that the Hebrews understood. For the Hebrews, when you tried to describe God, the prophets would say, well, we know what God is not. But for our two and a half pounds of brain to try to, 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 try to describe the divine, the mystery, it's unheard of. The poets would, would give their best accounts, but they always fell short. And so they understood God to be the great mystery, the life that gives everything life. You won't find Trinity, but what you will find is really interesting. The tradition of Trinity comes after New Testament is compiled. And Trinity teaches us this, God is in community. God functions as community. And this is what I mean by this. Father, right in the center, life. That's where life happens. If you want a, a good description of God, life. God is the center of life. Outside of that, you have Jesus, who shows us what life looks like lived out. If you've seen the Father, you've seen me. Jesus is love wrapped in flesh, walking among us. And then spirit is the breath that comes out. It's when you've begun walking in this new freedom, in this new life, you begin to share it with one another. And so this is what church family should look like. It should look like this. You and I come together and we experience life. When I was younger, my parents, every Sabbath, we would go to church. And my parents had a really good knack for finding the visitors. They always chose the most awkward visitors, though. My parents would, they would, they would bake so much food Friday and Saturday morning. And they would invite all of these visitors and a bunch of friends and family over. My house was packed with people every Sabbath. And what I saw, I would say, was heavenly. It was divine. People who'd never talked to each other before are sharing their stories. They're talking about life. You had friends and family coming together, and what I saw was beautiful and divine. It was the only time in my life where I can think of where I would just sit on the floor, and before I knew it, I was falling asleep to the beautiful voices and laughter of community. That's community. That's the divine. And so you and I, we experience that life. And what happens is we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. We are Christians, many Christs, and we live that out. And we stumble and we fumble through it. We have moments where we stumble. We might hurt others or hurt ourselves, but we're learning to walk in it. And after we walk in it for a time, then we can start breathing it out to the marginalized, the people on the outskirts, the other. And when we breathe out that life, that's when we can bring others into the center where God is, where life is. So that they might begin to walk in it, that they might be able to breathe it out and bring others in. That's divine community. And so our prayer today as a congregation, as a leadership team, is that you might take time on the Sabbath to fully enjoy the family you have. Fully enjoy the friends you have. 
drop your stupid cell phone for two minutes and participate in a conversation with your loved ones. Spend time together in community. Because if you will allow yourself to open your eyes, you will get glimpses of the divine. And when you see that, it changes everything. So again, our prayer for you today is that you might enjoy and be present to God in community because that is the best picture we have of God. Family is where the life is. Family is where we observe God the most. So enjoy that today. Before God bless you.